Thank you, Eugene. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> I was not prepared uh, for that intro um, or that time in worship, really. Thank you. I just want to say thank you all for being here uh, today to worship Jesus with me. It is truly an honor and a privilege to uh, not just stand up here and now be able to speak some words to you, um, but to be among you and praising our Lord, worshiping him because he is glorious and wonderful and I'm so excited to see familiar faces, my friends and family, um, and some new brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, such an honor, um, such a privilege. I do, uh, I, I always want to uh, find myself in the word, in the scriptures. Uh, whenever I say anything, um, I'm, I'm careful and I'm, I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, what, what do you have for me today in this meeting with a friend, uh, in, in my workplace, in my school, in my studies? And I want us to even take a moment to ask that right now even though it might be um, obvious or expected, we're at church. <laughs> of course we're meeting with God. Of course, uh, you know, we're gonna do these things like worship him and, and read the scriptures, read his word. We're gonna hear from him. We're gonna hear his voice. However you, ex you communicate that, wherever you expect, maybe you came here today and you're not expecting anything. Maybe you're doing this because you have to, because you're with a family member who insists that you come with them to church, uh, or, or you're just trying it out. Maybe you're wondering, what is there to this thing? Why do these people, these weird people, meet together every week and sing these songs to this God that they can't see? Like, what, what, what's happening here? And really, all, all this to say is that I want us to take a moment and just pause and recognize that you can, you can actually ask him, God, what, what are you doing? What is it that you want to say to me today? What is it you want to do for me today? What is the work that you're doing in my heart? Maybe he's not going to say anything at all. Maybe he's just going to listen to you. What if that was it? What if he said, I just want to listen to you. I just want to know what's going on. I want, I want to hear it from your mouth. You tell me how you're feeling, how you're doing. This I know, whatever he has for you is perfect. It is exactly what you need. This is the conclusion of this psalm. <laughs> there you go, the, I give you the end at the beginning. Um, the conclusion is that whatever God has whether he has something to say, whether he's repeating himself for the hundredth time, you've heard it before, it seems redundant, or if he is silent, and all you, you know is that he's with you. You can't put it to words, maybe. You can't explain it. You just know he's here. He sees me. He knows me. Whatever it is, it's perfect, and it's just what you need. I read NIV version, by the way, if you uh, want to match it up on your phones. If you have a physical Bible that is not NIV, it's okay. Psalm 23. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and love will follow me 
all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. (sighs) Lord Jesus, thank you for this promise. The certainty that we can have as your children, that your goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Your goodness and love will follow us all the days of our life. As the song we sung this morning, your goodness is running after me. Lord, show us what this means today. Not just some uh, theological concept that uh, can stimulate our intellect or our minds, but really, experientially, what does this look like? That divine goodness Godly goodness and love. The love and the goodness of Yahweh is running after me. Show us your glory, Lord. May we see your face. Amen. This is uh, probably my favorite scripture section of scriptures in in the Bible. It's the first scripture I ever memorized (laughs) uh, before I was a believer. (laughs) Uh, I went to this this club called Royal Rangers. I don't even remember what it was about. Um, Maybe some of you are familiar. Um, But I had this task at some point to memorize Psalm 23, and the reward uh, was that I would get a bag of candy uh, for doing so, uh, of my choice. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to get Butterfingers because I love Butterfingers. Um, I'm a sucker for them. And so I did. I, I went through uh, the process of memorizing it and saying it word for word, King James Version, uh, so it was authentic and real. Um, and and I, I did all this, and I was told, okay, you're going to get your reward, but instead of getting Butterfingers, I got a different candy because they had run out. Uh, and, and they said we'll get you some Butterfingers later, these people. They never did. So I was extremely disappointed that I went through all this work um, and I didn't get my reward. (laughs) I didn't get what I wanted. Um, I didn't really have a purpose of sharing that story other than uh, it's kind of silly. Um, And uh, and that, honestly, I was missing the point (laughs) of of this scripture. Uh, And I kind of just had a moment with the Lord as he brought that to my memory uh, and it basically told me, Max, there's so much more to life than candy. And that's simple, maybe obvious. Halloween's coming up, so maybe we're thinking about it. Um, there are young people here, or if you have children, they're getting excited because they're going to get a bucket of candy, possibly, if that's your tradition. Um, I don't know. We don't really do that. Uh, but <clears throat> um, there's so much more to life than than pleasure than than what this world has to offer. David uh, says it this way, the Lord, Yahweh, this is the the name of God, how God introduces himself to Moses and to his people ultimately. Just want to pause for a second, realize who, who we're talking about right now. As Eugene said, the creator, sustainer of all things, the Lord of the universe, the God over all, the one who uh, delivered Israel from their captivity and bondage in Egypt, who through these massive, miraculous uh, displays of power, these plagues, saved these, these pitiful slaves from this evil ruler. He delivered them from bondage. The God who gives life to the dead. This God, Yahweh, David says, is my shepherd. And the conclusion he draws is, because of that, I lack nothing. It's it's tempting, I think, for us to read, or at least in my experience, to read this psalm 
and feel kind of removed or distant. Uh, like, this is not really reality. But this is so real for David that God, Yahweh, is his shepherd, meaning God cares for me intimately, so carefully. He takes care of all that I need. And because of that, I lack nothing. He describes this care, saying, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He gives me my food. He sustains me. He leads me beside quiet waters. In order for a sheep to get down and drink, uh, there would have to be uh, water, which was still enough, quiet enough, peaceful enough, and clean, uh, that they would feel safe enough to, to, to get low and drink. And it's this picture of just this careful attendance that God has in providing for David. These green pastures, these quiet waters, he says, verse three, he refreshes my soul. To summarize up to this point, basically what David is saying is, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. I lack nothing. Pause for a second. What, is, what comes to mind when you hear this phrase, I lack nothing? Or maybe your version or King James, um, I shall not want. Did you want today? Have you had moments today or this week where you felt like, I'm lacking? I don't have the time to get this done. Or I don't have the strength to go on. I don't have the patience to bear with my children. I don't have uh, the integrity to do this thing. I don't have the skills that I need. I'm not ready for this exam coming up. I'm not ready to face this counseling session. What comes to mind? What, what are you lacking? I don't think David is saying, uh, I never experience hunger, or I never experience thirst, or I never experience um, a broken relationship. I never experience discomfort when I'm sitting in the pews. I never experience, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, whatever point of lack you might experience in this world. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I never experience a lack of care. I never go without having care, without somebody to meet me in my pain, in my hunger, in my suffering, in my weakness, and tend to me. Specifically, tend to my soul. This is the claim David is making. And the focus is not, what do I lack? but rather, who cares for me? Who sees my lack and who meets me there? So in summary, you could say, because Yahweh cares for me, I'm totally cared for. I do not lack a shepherd. His care is perfect. He refreshes my soul. It's interesting that David would say this, uh, that that he would express this need for his soul to be refreshed. Think about it. If he's under the perfect care of God, why would his soul not always just be full? If God is caring for him, why does he need this continual refreshment? This speaks to a, uh, a hunger, a need for the care of God, for the care of the shepherd. It means that you can't live today off of what you ate yesterday. The refreshment God gave you this week on Wednesday or on Thursday um, is not enough to keep you going forever. 
The refreshment he gives you this morning is enough for today, but not enough for tomorrow. Every day, moment by moment, we have need for this care. And David says he never fails to do it. He guides me, he says, along the right paths for his name's sake. And notice something about these first few verses. Uh, Things are going good. Everything is right. Everything is as it should be. Green pastures, quiet waters. He restores my soul. I'm on the right path for his name's sake. Everything is good. What are these right paths? Well, I like uh, the series you guys are going through, First Things First. That's a cool way to think about any time maybe you read Scripture. I've, I've kind of been doing this in my own time to just ask the question, okay, what's the first thing here? What's the, what's the focus? What, is the, what, what comes first? What's the most important thing? Um, well, I think uh, from what I've gathered that the, the first thing here is for his name's sake. He guides me on the right paths for his name's sake. That the right path for you, you might, you might be wondering, uh, what is God's will for my life? How am I supposed to live? What job am I supposed to do? Uh, where should I go to school? How should I raise my children? Um, how many children should I have? <laughs> Uh, should I even have children? Uh, <clears throat> all good questions. Uh, what should I do this week? Should I attend this midweek service or this Bible study? You might even ask, you know, uh, where should I go to church? Uh, should I go to church today? Now, all of us might, uh, might say on the face of it, this is the right path. Going to church is the right path. That might be obvious. Uh, Caring for your children is the right path. Loving them and and nurturing them is the right path. But the fact is, the world can do all these things. Worldly people can go to church. They can act spiritual. They can do religious things. Worldly people can care for their children. Anybody in the world uh, can... Uh, go and feed the homeless, serve the poor. What does it mean to do all of these things or to do anything for his name's sake? What is his name? Yahweh. Who is he? The creator, sustainer of all things, the God of the universe, all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, infinite. What can we do for him? What does it mean to walk right paths for his name's sake? Well, uh, going back to what I said about first things first, the focus is not on the specific thing you're doing, I think, but it's on how you're doing it, and who you are, who you are as you're doing it. See, the purpose is not to figure out the the specific uh, details of what God intends for you to do with your life, and then do those things, and then you've made it. You have to find the the specific person that you have to marry, or the, the, the the, the perfect job that is going to you know, best use your gifts and abilities and talents and provide for your family, uh, or the, the perfect you know, career or, or, or um, you know, study, school, uh, whatever you're, I'm trying to say, degree. Uh, there we go. I'm in school now, so I should know that. Um, it's not about that. It's who you are in all of these things. Who are you? You're a sheep of the shepherd. It's about being his as you go and do these things. Why is it that you came to church today? 
What does it mean to come to church for his name's sake? Is it uh, to feel a little better about yourself? Is it because you're expected to? Because you know a lot of people know that you come to this church, and if you don't show up, they're going to wonder why? (laughs) Would you be ashamed if you didn't come? My hope um, this morning is that you'd recognize there's time today, right here, right now, in this place, for God to care for you. There's time and there's space. For whatever reason you came, uh, however you made it here, whether you were irritable, or um, begrudging these things, or you didn't really feel like it today, or maybe you're excited. (laughs) You're excited to see people, to worship Him. It's not always, uh, you know, difficult. I think you know. Whatever reason, there's time and there's a place for God to meet you and minister to you, to speak to you. That's what he wants to do. Verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This seems like a scene change, right? These first few verses, notice that the perspective changes. He begins by saying in third person, Yahweh is my shepherd. He does all these things. He guides me. He leads me. He makes me lie down. He restores my soul. You could say initially David starts by by giving this testimony, testifying or declaring to others, hey, God takes care of me, and it's amazing. It's perfect. And then the perspective changes as he describes walking through this dark valley or the valley of the shadow of death. He says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This first person, direct language to God. So it seems like things have shifted, things have changed. But I want to suggest that this isn't a a change of scene, that there is one consistent scene throughout this psalm, and that is that God is a shepherd who cares for his sheep. That throughout this whole psalm, though it looks like there's shifts uh, or changes uh, in in circumstances or in the scene, uh, it's consistent throughout where David is expressing, I am the Lord's sheep. I am God's sheep, and he is my shepherd. What's changing is not the scene, but what's in view. What David is aware of surrounding him in his world He says, though I walk through the darkest valley, anticipating this is going to happen. Jesus told his disciples in uh, John 16, 33, um, essentially he says, there will be trouble in the world. You will face trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. He's saying, there's going to be problems. You're going to struggle. People are going to come against you. It's going to be difficult. But take heart. And what he, what he means when he says take heart, he says over and over again in the Gospels, don't be afraid. Don't fear the trouble. Don't fear the circumstances. Don't fear what's going on out there. Because I've overcome, I'm greater. And this is exactly what we see here. That though David walks through these dark valleys, this is a reality of of shepherding sheep. And I think something where uh, this analogy of the sheep and the shepherd is helpful is that sheep can't stay in the same pasture forever. 
It'll eventually eat all the good grass, all the good nutrients, um, and it'll, be, it'll die if they stay there forever. They have to move from one to another. And the fact is that uh, in these places, there weren't just adjacent uh, you know, fields, uh, pastures. There would, there would be this uh, path that you'd have to travel going from one green pasture to the next, to the next, to the next. And it was necessary that you would travel through these valleys, these places of death, where there's no sustenance. And this is the reality of this life. That in order to re- remain in green pastures, we have to move, go through the valley, go through the trouble. And notice too that um, the threat is real. There really is a danger. There really are problems in the world. But David says, though it's dark, though it's difficult, though the threat is real, I will not fear. Why? Because of what Jesus says to his disciples every time he says, do not be afraid. Every time. He says, don't don't be afraid when you lose your job. Uh, Don't be afraid when you're parents neglect you. Don't be afraid when your children rebel. Don't be afraid when your marriage is falling apart. Don't be afraid when evil people seem to prosper. Why? Because I'm going to destroy them or I'm going to give you a a, a bunch of money. You're going to get a random paycheck uh, out of nowhere. Or or I'm going to... um, you know, fix your grade. Even though you failed, somehow it's going to come out that you got an A. No, it's, it's not that he's going to make that circumstance right in your eyes. He says, don't be afraid because I'm with you. That's the difference. What has changed? Not the circumstance, but your awareness that the shepherd is with me. He's caring for me. And, and again, notice that the scene hasn't changed. It's the shepherd caring the whole time. And going through the valley, your view might change. You might see things. You might become aware, wow, there's really some wrong stuff going on in the world. The world's really a broken place. There are really bad people. Or you might even see, I'm a really bad person. Wow, I am really lazy. Wow, I'm really uh, angry with my children. Wow, I'm really impatient with my spouse. Wow, this, the world is so messed up. I'm messed up. And you might be tempted to fear. You might be tempted to think, gosh, there's no hope. What can we do? Who can make this right? What could anybody do? This is the hope, David says. You, God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff, this image of protection, of instruction, of discipline, guidance, correction. Whatever it is you need today from your shepherd. Do you need direction? Do you need to be disciplined? Do you need instruction? Notice that Whatever it is you need, 
the signature of the shepherd, the mark that he is caring for you, is comfort. In every circumstance, all the time, when God is caring for you, there will always be comfort. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know you're with me because I'm being comforted. Yes, I was wrong, or yes, I I made a mistake, or I stumbled. Or I just lack the ability to see, to know what is good. I know you're with me. I know it's you because you comfort me. How did we get in the darkest valley in the first place? How do we, we end up in these situations? Well, I think two primary ways. One, as I mentioned, we can't stay in the same little pasture forever. God moves us. He speaks to us in a fresh way, in a new way. He leads us. Um, He makes a new day every day. And sometimes he, he uses, oftentimes, he uses the times of uncertainty, of feeling the lack, feeling the hunger, feeling the the thirst to remind us and to to show us, I want to satisfy you. I want to meet you. I want to speak to you. I want to meet that need right now. Other times, uh, we are in the valley because we've wandered. Is this not true? Oh, how often I wander from the green pasture. Maybe I think I see a better one. It's just a mile down the road. I can make it. Gosh, you know, my responsibilities and what I have today is important, but I feel like I just need to take some time and play a video game or... or, uh, Go eat something, because I'm just feeling a little down. Or maybe I need to go look at this website to feel affirmed, feel validated. Or just think about it in my own head. However it is, we, we look out and we think we see greener pastures. We wander. We leave the provision, the care of God But notice, the result is the same. He's with me. He still cares for me. Whether whether I'm being led from a pastor to another or I've wandered myself, the shepherd cares to pursue you. His goodness is running after you. I think it's it's, uh, good and it's worth noticing that it's vague how you got to this dark valley. It doesn't say, oh, when you were taking me from that one pasture to the other, um, I was in this valley. Or, or when I wandered that one time, I was in that valley. Uh, <clears throat> there's room for imagination, for real life. It's messy. The fact is, the valleys are real. However you got there, the shepherd cares for you. That's the point. In the last couple of verses, um, maybe we'll, we'll have the uh, worship band get ready, start playing some instrumental um, music. David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Again, it seems like a, a, a scene change. There's this, we're we're moving from walking through the valley to now sitting and dining at this table. Not only that, the the presence of evil or darkness seems to have come closer to us. Then it was, I'll fear no evil in this kind of general sense. Uh, I'm walking through this valley, it's dark, and it's kind of scary. Now we're, we're dining at this table in the presence of enemies. 
They're right there. Nearby. Why is this significant? Um, well, one, as I mentioned, because the presence of enemies is real. It's important uh, we recognize that. It is real. You can't just say, no, you're not, you're not, really, uh, you're not really there or ignore them in that sense. Um, there really are people who hate you. For David, it wasn't just that they were mean, they used mean words, they used mean weapons. <laughs> David's enemies tried to kill him regularly. We have an enemy who hates us because we're children of God. Satan hates you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. There's people in the world who hate you. Maybe you're aware of them. This is what God does in the presence of our enemies, in the midst of this broken world. He says, come to me, sit with me, dine with me, sit at the table I've prepared. Let me feed you. Notice, because the enemies are around, he doesn't cancel the invitation. He doesn't say, never mind, it's not a good day. No, I can't, I can't uh, meet your needs when things are so bad. Let me go take care of them first. No, he says, I'm going to take care of you first. We don't need to uh, remove those problems. I don't need to deal with that right now. The first thing I want to care for you. Look at this language, this table. It says, you anoint my head with oil. This is a peculiar word, this anoint word. It's not the word that we see when speaking about anointing of kings um, or setting people apart to, to, for some great service uh, for God. This word uh, is only used about a dozen times in the Old Testament. And every time it refers to this fattening or making fat. Isn't that weird? <laughs> you make my head fat with oil. <laughs> what is that? Well, it refers to this nourishment, this strengthening, this health. Another way you could say it is, you make me healthy with your oil. And this is a symbol of hospitality, that when somebody would come into your home, you would welcome them and they would know that they're welcomed by pouring oil on them. They would know, okay, I'm, I'm here uh, to be served, to be fed, to be taken in. Here we have this picture of David traveling, weary from the journey, surrounded by his enemies, Dusty and dirty. And Yahweh, his shepherd, says, Come here. Come here close. I want to pour out all that I have on you. And that's exactly the language we see. It's not just like, here, have a little oil. It's, it's this outpouring, this, this continuous flowing. Another way you could say this, along with the cup, um, is not just that the oil is, is poured out and then I have this cup that's filled to the brim, um, but this language indicates this constant flowing and overflowing, filling. Your cup is just, there's a, there's a pitcher and it's just pouring in your cup forever. And you bring it to your mouth and it's still there and you put it back and it's still just overflowing. And the oil, just continuously, you're welcome here. I want you. I'm so happy you're here. It 
How can we be sure that this is the case? How can we be sure that really, because this all sounds great, right? In the presence of enemies, um, though I walk through these dark valleys of the world, there's trouble out there. God is going to care for me. God is going to take care of me. God is going to meet my needs. How can you know for sure that's the case? Well, because of what Jesus did for you. He told his disciples, those following him, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to live. (laughs) What? What? What is he talking about? What does that even mean? Eat his flesh? You have to become a cannibal? Yikes. Um, No, he's referring to communion. What his body and his blood represent for us. That as our good shepherd, he laid down his life for us. That we get to feast on this reality that God has given himself to us. This is what we see in the care of the shepherd. Not just um, like a a, a nice little welcome and here's some stuff for the road, Um, but he's like, I'm pouring out all of myself for you. I am giving myself to you. He's calling us to wait at the table so that he can wait on us. Isn't that wild? God wants to serve you. Yikes. It almost feels wrong. Like, no, we should be serving him. He's the he's God. He wants to serve you. He wants to meet your needs. He wants to satisfy you. Jesus laid down his life to prove it. He sacrificed himself on the cross. Not just like a, you know, he, he uses this language, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. When you think about that, you think, okay, um, he's risking his life, the shepherd. Maybe there's a wolf or a bear or a lion. He's risking his life to protect the sheep so they can live. What happens if a shepherd dies trying to save the sheep? Well, probably the sheep are going to die too. (laughs) What do you think about it? (laughs) Um, If he fails, if he dies, yikes, uh, no more shepherd. But in this case, Jesus' death isn't just like jumping in front of a bullet so that you don't get hit. Um, He's doing something, he, it's necessary that he has to die. Because the fact is, God could not be our shepherd without his death. Because we've sinned, because we've rebelled against him, we've wandered, we've rejected him. This is what it is for Jesus to um, set the table for us to offer his body, to say, this is my body which is for you, this bread. And the cup, this new covenant. And so in conclusion, um, this is what it means. This, this summary verse, verse six, sorry, we're going a little long. Um, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's goodness and love, this chesed, chesed love, unfailing love. This this word that is difficult to translate from Hebrew to English, uh, because for us, love can mean so many different things. You might say mercy, but the gist of it is that it's this movement this movement from God, God coming to us and saying, I'm giving you all that I have, all that I am. I'm doing everything it takes to care for you, to save you, to give you life. 
and nothing will uh, stop me. The presence of enemies will not stop me. The, your troubles will not stop me. I will satisfy you. I will meet your needs. And so David testifies of this and says, Surely, God, your mercy, your love, your goodness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in your house forever. I'll sit at your table forever. Every day I'll be satisfied by you. Your circumstances may not uh, change today. You know, the problems, the evil, it might not go away right away, right today. But what you can count on, what you can depend on, what you can know with certainty, absolute certainty, is that the shepherd will care for you. God will care for you. He will give you exactly what you need. I want us to take just a minute um, and just be quiet with him. Just think about him. If there's a, a verse that, that has burned into your head now that you can't get out of your mind or something that he has said to you, just think on it. Spend some time with him. Let's do that now. It might help uh, bow your head, close your eyes, maybe hold out your hands. J assume whatever posture you need. Maybe it'll help you just to, to focus your, your mind and your heart. Let's do that. Lord Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that it um, doesn't depend on our performance. That you do not dwell in a house built with human hands. But Lord, you've made a dwelling in our hearts. You've come so near to us. You've invited us into your house and you've, you've made a home in us. May we worship you in spirit and in truth for all that you've done. Thank you for forgiving us for our sin, for not holding it against us. You've set us free from the bondage of sin. We have no fear of condemnation, so we can freely confess our sins to you and to each other. Help us, Lord, to walk in the light as we go out today, that we would not fear the evil or try to um, hide from it, but to remember that you're with us, you care for, for us, you tend to our needs, our souls. Satisfy us, Lord, with your unfailing love. In Jesus' name, amen.